Hello! I'm going to be doing a bit of a exploration on the romance genre today. Over the last year since I started my channel I have been doing a bit of an exploration of the fantasy genre. It began as a bit of a fantasy romance exploration and then it just moved into general fantasy and sci-fi and then I really realised that actually I want to explore loads of other areas within literature that I don't normally read so I've been planning and just haven't yet gotten around to filming one about graphic novels because that's something that I have recently been introduced to and learnt a bit more about. There are other genres so I'm looking at doing one on the memoir or, or biography genre, the play format, poetry I've been getting a bit more into this year. So there's lots of different areas that I want to explore. Now I have been putting off filming this video because what I wanted to do in these videos was to bring a bit more of my research from my degree that I've been working on um, and for the romance genre in particular I've been doing a lot of research for a project that I completed this year around this this area of literature that's called the feminine middle brow novel, something I'd never heard of until I started doing this project that I was working on and I found it really fascinating and it's what really prompted me to want to make this video. <laughs> but the thing is, I've just been feeling like I really need a mental break. I mean, that's why I really wanted to read romance over the last month or two is because I really need a mental break from all the academic work. And so, unfortunately, this is not going to be that academic video where I bring in proper research. I will, of course, because my opinions are based on my life experience, I will, of course, be talking about how I feel about these books. And that will, of course, include some of my academic knowledge, but it just won't be quite <laughs> the exploration that I had originally intended for this video. But the first thing I want to mention is that this is one of those big dividing topics is the romance genre similar to like thrillers um some general contemporary fiction is often touted as easy fiction and that is something that i'm guilty of as well i have often mocked my sister for instance who prefers romance that are what i would just consider an easy read rather than a literary read if i were to give her a literary book i don't think she'd enjoy it and so i often mock her for this you know it's an ellie type of book <laughs> And that's not fair because there are a lot, there is a lot that you can get from these books and I enjoy these books. They're just not the sorts of books that I tend to give five stars because I like there to be a bit more depth, which is what the literary genre gives you. Let's hope I made some sense there. So often these books are then given these categories of highbrow, very literary books, books like what you'd expect to see on the Booker Prize. Then there's lowbrow, books like some of the, uh, like you might consider some of the really trashy novels, you might consider some of this like graphic horror, you might consider um, like Wattpad fan fiction, stuff like that tends to be considered lowbrow, but then you have this area that's called the middlebrow novel. And I think many of the books that I'm going to talk about today would fall somewhere within this middlebrow area, either slightly towards lowbrow or slightly towards highbrow, but always somewhere within that spectrum of middlebrow novel. And the middlebrow novel is something which... Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to jump in here because I realised how little sense I was making on this little spiel that I went on. Essentially what I was saying was that during my research, um, I was using the work of Nicola Humble, who wrote uh, the feminine middlebrow novel, uh, from the 1920s to the 1950s and in it she discusses how at this time period highbrow culture was never considered anything that discussed the domestic sphere so anything that related to a woman's life and obviously at that time point the woman's life was to do with the domestic it was to do with children it was to do with the family um, and so highbrow culture completely excluded anything that related to that even if you might be reading a book that was considered middlebrow and thought actually this is drawing on so many relevant themes it's got so many like layers of meaning you know i would consider this literary i would consider this really brilliant <laughs> it was never considered that it was given its own little genre of the middlebrow novel genre categorization whatever you might call it um, so this is what i was learning about for my essay and my research project on i capture the castle which if my mark is good enough, I might sort of deliver to you later on. So this is where I then think the Women's Prize for Fiction comes in because that is a literary award that is recognising women's fiction that is discussing issues that are important to women 
and this is why it was so closely linked to what I was learning about in this 90s, 1920s to 1950s feminine middle brown novel. That's why this was quite an interesting little project for me to do, working, looking at romance books. Whilst my brain was a bit mushy <laughs> from all the academic work, it actually it fitted nicely. It gave me all these things to think about. Um, but I do not articulate that very well in this video, so I'm going to cut that out <laughs> and just leave you with this. Sorry for the quality. <laughs> Anyway, you can see my brain is not quite ticking over and that's why this video is not going to be the academic one that I had intended. I just wanted to get it out of there. I just want to talk about books. I want to get back to talking about books. Otherwise, there's going to be a massive gap on my channel if I just stop talking about books until I'm ready to do it in an academic manner. Like, just stop it. But anyway, this is where we are. <laughs> We're in a world, let's try and clarify this. We're in a world where the Women's Prize for Fiction, I feel, is very much a middle brow area. It's something that is bringing in things that affect women into the literary sphere, but is not necessarily the highbrow literature that you'd expect from the Booker Prize. That's where I'm considering us to be. You can disagree with me if you want, but that's my opinion. It's not a negative opinion. It is just a neutral. This is what I think. <laughs> this is what I think it is. <sighs> okay. Because why should the domestic sphere not be literary? I've got about six to seven books that I'm gonna be talking about today. What I'm going to do is talk to you about the books. I'll then rank them when I finish talking about them to let you know how I got on with them. Because at the moment, I don't consider myself a big romance reader, but it is a genre that I like to fall back on when I'm feeling in a slump, when I'm feeling mentally drained. A bit like the thriller genre. I like to pick up a good thriller if I'm feeling like I need a really quick read, something that I want to devour. For me, romance really needs to include smart... <laughs> It's just my preference. I did want to try and make sure that I was reading diversely within this genre because I think what we can end up with is a very heteronormative, very white or Eurocentric ideal of relationships. So hello, thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to take a moment to share with you that I have relaunched my online print sales. My website is analogholly.com and you can purchase my colour prints for £15 my darkroom prints for £25, homemade here <laughs> in my space. And I just thought I would share with you some of the ones that I have made uh, for this relaunch. So we have this. A really gorgeous paper stock that looks like watercolour paper, a rosebud, as you can see. I quite like a good abstract, blurry <laughs> image. So we're starting with some nature prints for this launch. These are homemade black and white prints from my darkroom. Sorry for the shine there. So that one's the diner, fern, palm, dandelion and wave crash on the beach. It's hard to see on this, but the waves are in, you can see all the waves. It's just hard to see on this camera. Um, as I say, you can go and check out more images on my website and I would be so grateful for any support that you show me. If you're watching this in the month of July, 2023, there is a code woohoo10 to get 10% off as I celebrate relaunching my print sales. Thank you so much. The first thing I wanted to do, and I think this shows just how inexperienced I am with the genre and with the tropes that are included, I picked up some books, so I've got two that I'm going to talk about because they have similar things I want to mention, but one of them I thought was better than the other, which is why I want to talk about both. Two books by Lily Gold. Now she writes, I don't know ex whether it's exclusively, but all the ones that I saw advertised by her were about this thing called Reverse Harem. And I thought this meant it was going to be a representation of polyamorous relationships, which it is, but I don't think it's a very realistic representation of polyamorous relationships. And I think that's what I wanted. Polyamory is not something I have personal experience of, but it's something that I know is a thing and that I wanted to sort of experience vicariously through my literature. I wanted to, ex I wanted to see how other people felt about it. I wanted to read from the perspective of someone who was in one of those relationships. But the two books I read, one was called Nanny for the Neighbours and one was called Faking with Benefits. The first one I read was Faking with 
benefits. This one I found to be quite enjoyable. I would give it, I'll just come straight out of the bat, I would give it about 3.5 stars. I read it quite voraciously, um, even though it's quite a long book, I think it's about 500 pages, but I think because you've got four people within the relationship and you're you're reading from each of their perspectives, that's why it's so long, but it didn't feel like a long read, like I read it really quickly, so it was on par with like a 300 page book, just in a long one. <laughs> so yes, it was a very enjoyable read. I loved a lot of the banter that was going on between the characters, the chemistry, you know, the dialogue was good, but considering it was had multiple perspectives, I never felt like there was much differentiation between the perspectives. I often had to sort of flick back to the start of the chapter to remind myself whose perspective we were in, because unless they mentioned something about their lives or they started talking to someone else and mentioned their name, it was often very confusing whose perspective we were in, because they all sounded the same. It's also a very eroticised view of polyamorous relationships. I don't think it's a realistic representation. I think it's very much a romantic, well, eroticisation of being a woman who is wanted by three different men. The men did, weren't necessarily in the relationship with each other, except for, say, emotionally. They were all just very much focused on the woman. And I, yeah, I think that's like a... I don't think that's realistic. I don't think you'd be in a polyamorous relationship. I might be wrong. I could well be wrong. But that's how it felt. It didn't feel genuine. But the book was good. So that's why I then moved on to Nanny for the Neighbours. Similar premise. Three guys living in an apartment. One girl who is their neighbour. They end up in a relationship over some occurrence. Um, but this one, I just got a bit fed up with. I felt like the chemistry wasn't as good, the banter wasn't as good, the storyline wasn't as good, and all these things. So I gave that one like a 2.5 stars. So yeah, if you're just looking for a quick read, these books are fine, but they're not a good representation of polyamory. There's not a lot of depth to them. I think like it, it tried to tackle childhood traumas and things, and uh, being adopted, and Stuff like that, but not very superficially, I felt. Okay, the next one I'm going to talk about, not necessarily the next one I read, is The Roommate by Rosie Dunan. This one came to me through like a mystery book box thing. Usually if I get romances, I tend to just pass them straight on because I'm not that, it's not something I reach for. But this one had me intrigued because it suggests on the back, uh, while they may not agree on much, both Josh and Clara believe women deserve better sex. Uh, what they decide to do about it will change both of their lives and if they're lucky they'll help everyone else get lucky too. So it was about being like a sex positive romance. So I felt suitably intrigued and when I did occasionally see other booktubers talking about it everyone seemed really into it and really loved it. So that's why it stayed on my list and so now I have finally gotten around to it. The male main character in this is in the sex industry. He is a porn star. And so I thought that was politically a very interesting storyline. But <laughs> this one was really interesting to me because it really showed me the difference between literary fiction and romance fiction. Because this built up, it built up and up and up politically to the point where there's supposed to be a legal case happening, which, and I found this subplot really interesting. But then when we got to, like, <laughs> the climax of the political case where there was going to be this um, actual court case, it cut and then it moved to the ep to the epilogue, you know, two years later, happily ever after type epilogue. And I was like, there you go. See, if this was literary fiction, that might probably have been the main focus of the book. If that had been the case, if we'd had this sort of like romance uh, with the smut, but pushed that legal case, that political thing around the sex industry into the forefront and made that the main plot. This could have been a five star read for me. I would say I'd probably give it a four stars. It would be one of the highest rated on this list. The one I probably the one I enjoyed the most. I'm gonna keep it because I could see myself rereading it if I'm ever in another slump. It was really good. But yeah, I think if it like that had just been pushed up into the main plot line, the political story, that would have been a five star. So there you go, I have really learnt something there. <laughs> uh, actually, let me come back to this one quickly before I move on, because there was something that I found very intriguing. The male main character is a, 
a porn star, but just as he meets our female main character, the one with whom he's going to have his romantic entanglement, he goes on strike. So this is where a lot of this political story comes from, from his employer, the, the people he has his contract with. He decides to go on strike and stop working. So he is not having any sex with any other woman, even as part of his job, which obviously his job entails a lot of that, throughout the whole story. Meaning that he is faithful to this other woman in like all senses of the word, even if she would be happy enough to distance herself from his job and consider that not being unfaithful. And so what we end up with is quite a, he even though it starts to tackle these other things, it's quite a heteronormative storyline where it's a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. Just thought that was quite interesting, that 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 had to be part of the story. The next one I read, which I think was Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. I've been meaning to read this one for quite a while. I think for quite a few months this year, I've had it on my TBR. I thought this was brilliant. So this one includes chronic illness representation. Our female main character has horrendous migraines. Like she has to have special medication. They're completely debilitating. So quite an interesting extra layer to the story. And from reading the blurb about the author, the afterword, that is something that she suffers with. So it's something that she has experience of. And so she inc incorporated that into the story, which I thought was good. This is a second chance romance. Possibly the first I've ever read of that sort of trope that's considered a romance trope, where it's two very troubled teenagers who meet, spend a week together. Feelings are intense, feelings are fraught. Um, and then something happens that separates them and then they meet many years later she's now a mother with a teenage child they are both famous authors and they meet again at a literary awards which again was quite an interesting thing funnily enough I recently started and had to DNF Yellowface by RF Kuang or Rebecca Kuang which tackle similar themes about the diversity issues in publishing and some of the things that publishing houses do that are sometimes like ostensibly about promoting diversity in publishing but then actually have like the opposite impact and come from really like not nice places I had to DNF yellow face I found it just not an enjoyable read uh, but the thing is I never hear anyone talking about that until I start saying that I've DNF'd it and then people start coming out of the woodwork and saying actually no I didn't enjoy it either I think it was too on the nose I felt like I was being sort of punched in the face with this idea that the, the publishing industry had these negative things going on and there was nothing really else going on in the story other than this thing that just kept being like shoved down my throat hopefully her other books are better but anyway that's a bit of a tangent back to this one the diversity issues within publishing are more of a backstory they are not the main issue and I thought that was much better done so things like where she's um had the rights to her book sold for a movie whatever that the terminology is but then the director feels that they should go for a white main character even though her characters are all people of colour anyway I thought that was a brilliant book I don't think I have much else to say about that I thought that was a genuinely really good book that might be the highest rated I think that might push out this one I think I had more issues with what happened in this one a negative that I can think of for seven days in June, is that the relationship she has with her daughter, her daughter is very, like, woke. <laughs> and I don't know if that's, like, actually a good representation of children these days. We have, like, everyone is getting better at talking about things like mental health. Everyone is getting better at representation and things like that. But is that a good reflection of what a teenager would be like today I don't know the relationship between mother and daughter I was like I would love to have a relationship like that where it was very much like a best friendship with my children and maybe the author is writing what she would like to see and I think that's a really lovely thing to do is to write what you want from the world how relationships with children should be but maybe it was a bit too much and actually <laughs> could do some harm because when you don't have that sort of relationship with your children you might then feel like you're some sort of a failure I don't know but there's just one one tiny thing only a niggle this is probably the closest to a five star we're gonna get do I think that's accurate yeah I think so <laughs> the next one I read was my may pick for 
TBR spin, you made a fool of death with your beauty. And this is where I'm, I've been saying, I think all of these books fall somewhere within middle brow, either leaning more towards high brow, which I think this is, I think this is the closest to literary that I have on this list, um, where, where some of them sort of are more towards low brow. I've spoken quite at length about this in my TBR spin video, which I will link. So I won't go into too much detail here, but essentially this one is perhaps the most messy of all the books that we that I've read for this. It does read like a romance in that way that you want to just keep reading it, the way that all of these read, um, but it is a lot more messy and that this is based on grief. So our protagonist is just returning to dating after having lost her husband in a horrific accident. And so the three relationships that we see her em embark on throughout this are all messy in their own way. I feel like they get progressively messier and it's divided opinion massively. P some people hate this, some people think it's absolutely disgusting the way this has been written, but I think that it's actually a very good idea to start representing other narratives of romance because something that I've noticed, I suppose it's because I've been with my partner for 15 years, is that most of romance is all about the blossoms, the blossoming of romance, the beginnings, the excitement. Whenever you read about romance or about, not romance, but about the relationship between people who have been together for a long time, people tend to fall back on the stereotypes of a stale love life or neglect, you know, some, some sort of emotional neglect from one partner to the other. So I think feel like there are some narratives that are missing from, from the romance genre, or at least I've just not found yet. So this is one that is talking about someone who is very grief-stricken um, and the ways in which that can very much influence how you behave within relationships. As I say, I won't go into too much detail because this is already going to be a relatively long video, but the thing that I really didn't like about this is the dialogue. The protagonist is only a couple of years younger than I am, but talks talks in, in a lot of slang, even when being with older generations, which I just don't think is something that people do. I think even young people who are used to talking in these slang terminology tend to put on a more respectful voice, tone of voice, phraseology when they're talking to older generations. If you if you encounter someone who's 20 years older than you, I think you tend to fall back into a more formal language, which doesn't happen in this. She, you know, she's talking to um, her friend's dad. Drop the book. Um, she's talking to her friend's dad, um, calling him bruh, and I mean, that's the only one that I can still think of. Um, I can't remember the other ones, but I just remember kept being pulled out of this book, just thinking, Ooh, that doesn't sound nice. Yeah, but... I did write this really highly. I think in that video I said I would give this like a 4.5 star. So I think I'm putting this on par with Seven Days in June by Tia Williams. I have two more books to talk to you about. And I realised when I got to this point that I had had no gender or sexuality diversity within what I'd been reading. So I w looked up some lists. I decided to do a little bit of list hopping for some of the most recommended romance books with, with other representation. Because while Akweke Amezi is a non-binary author, the book portrays a heterosexual relationship. So I came across one that is called Hold Me by Courtney Milan. This one has the cover that I'm the least happy about. <laughs> I don't like books with these sorts of covers and I feel like the like that suggests that it's going to be more lowbrow than middlebrow but this one has a female protagonist who is transgender female uh, and we have a oh, we have a bisexual male main character who has a very serious gay relationship prior to the events that we're seeing whereas there's some bisexuality in Akweke Amezi's um, novel but Hold Me is, I think, the most romance book of all these romance books <laughs> that I've read. It is the one with what I would say has the most straightforward plot, the one that feels the most romance plotty of them all, but I was just glad to have this extra representation. The transgender nature of the protagonist is not in the present day timeline is not like a negative thing like there's no like nothing is said to the person to make them feel less than like there's no 
horrible situation, which I think a lot of books with that sort of representation almost get pressured in order to be published to focus on the negative things that can happen when you are transgender, when you are gay, when you are, you know, anything other than heterosexual, cisgender, white person. Like, you can be pushed to publish something that is representing the negative lived experience, whereas this one in the present day is very much they are living their life, they are doing what they want to be doing, they are working things out for themselves, exploring what they want to do in their future. There are some things in the past where they've been rejected by family because of their choices over their gender, but it's not in the present day. In the present day, they are very much pushing forward with their life, and I liked that. Yeah, and I just thought it was excellent to have that representation. You know, someone who is transgender, who likes the romance genre, is going to love that book because it represents them it represents their experience of sexual interactions because it was the most straightforward romance I think it's possibly the one I enjoyed the least it was very readable I read it very quickly but it's probably also the most forgettable for me because it didn't do anything extra for me that's just a personal preference no not the most forgettable I think the lily gold ones yeah so it definitely goes above the lily gold I don't think it goes above the roommate but there we go it's a very like it's a very solid book a solid like 3.5 stars okay okay the final one because I wasn't going to include this one but I did end up reading it and this is Honey and Spice by Bolu Babalola last year I read her short story collection this is her debut novel this is what I believe is called a campus romance because it involves university it involves a British university, but the first thing I'm going to say is it didn't feel like a British university. But then I'm attending university as a mature student, so my experience of university is going to be very different to the experience of people who are like 19, 20 going to university and living like on campus in halls of residence. My experience is going to be very different to theirs, so maybe this is what it's like. It involves, you know, cliques of people who ultimately come together and are all friends. I just don't know whether that, that sort of tone of cliques and gossip blogs to do with the university is very British. I just don't know, I might be wrong. Um, it, fe it felt quite American. It felt like an American writing a British university, but she is a British author, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The dialogue is very slangy, but again, I'm older, so maybe this is how people talk to each other. I found I had to get through a few chapters to begin with of the dialogue before I got used to it. I have seen other people who have, who've had to DNF because they couldn't get through it. Once I got used to it, I don't know whether she eased up on using it and started writing more fluently, it, fluently for me, or whether I just naturally got used to it and then she was actually writing in the same way. I don't know. But yeah, you get used to it. It was a very quick read. Ultimately, like it was fine. <laughs> I hate to say it. This was the least smutty of all the books. Is that why I didn't necessarily enjoy it as much? I don't know. I don't know. So where are we ranking these? I think Seven Days in June is going to be my top. Then we've got You Made a Full of Death with Your Beauty. Then The Roommate. Maybe then Honey and Spice for enjoyment. No, Faking with Benefits. Faking with Benefits, Hold Me, Honey and Spice, Nanny for the Neighbours. That's my official ranking. I'm glad I've done this. You probably won't see another one on romance from me. At least not specifically romance. Something I'm really intrigued by is erotic fiction. Like, think Anais Nin. Um, I've recently read The Tryst by Monique Rothy. Think Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. Like, I'm interested in people who are pushing the boundaries of erotic fiction into the literary sphere. That's something that really fascinates me and something I'd like to explore more. So this is not romance. This is not pure erotica like por pornographic fiction. It is something else and I'm not sure what that's going to look like but that's a, that's an area that I think I may end up doing a bit more research on especially for university. Like something I'm really interested in but as a standard romance vlog, you're probably not going to see another one from me because it's still not my it's still not my favorite genre. I'm glad to have done this and to have experienced quite a few different books with different tropes, different things going on, different areas of diversity, but these books are great for when like now when I'm feeling my mind <laughs> needs something softer to digest, but it's never going to be my like they're never going to be five stars. They're never going to be my favorite books. So, 
Hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you in the next one.